Hello and welcome to Tipsy Tolstoy, Russian literature for the inebriated. I'm Matt, seasonal depression defeater, Gerasimovich. And I'm Cameron Lalana. This week, they finally reopened the haircutting places in my area, and I'm so excited. My undercut has gone places neither man nor hair was ever <laughs> intended to. Uh, thank you for that image. Uh, this is a podcast <laughs> where me and my good pal Cameron get to unwind from our weeks with some Russian literature and a drink or two. This week, we're going to be continuing our three-week-long series on the most important topic in Russian literature, what is to be done. Last week, we read Chernyshevsky's What is to be Done. Tonight, we're reading Tolstoy's What is to be Done. And next week, we will be reading Vladimir Lenin's What is to be Done. We might just find out what is to be done. But before we get into our show, we wanted to extend a quick shout-out to our newest patron, Emily. Thank you so much for supporting the show and keeping us funded again until we figure out what exactly it is to be done. Uh, if you're interested in being a cool listener like Emily, take a look at our Patreon at patreon.com slash tipsytolstoy. We put a lot of work into our tiers and rewards, and it really helps us keep the show going. If you're not able to support us financially at the moment, but you crave that sweet satisfaction of helping your favorite podcast, uh, you can leave us a nice review on Apple Podcasts or sign up for our email list on our website, tipsytolstoy.com. Yes, updates out of the way, we get to the most important topic of the day, Matt, what are you drinking? I am drinking a craft beer from a Chicago Ooh. brewery or a brewery right outside of Chicago. It is called uh, Clencher Six. It's a double IPA by Buckle Down Brewing. It is actually phenomenal. Sometimes when you get double IPAs, it's just really, really hoppy, which I don't mind. But this is just ooh smooth. Nice. I really enjoy that between you and me. I'm really into stouts and you're really into IPAs because mm -hmm. I... I it sounds like neither of us have much overlap in that particular area of drinking. So we, we cover a bigger area through our um, distastes. Well, it's also because just at least where I shop for beer, IPAs are significantly more common. Like I, I saw a stout that I almost bought to try, but it was one of like two in the whole beer aisle and it's a big aisle. So yeah. I, I don't know, for whatever reason, just I, I and like I said, I shop purely based on labels. So if I see a cool one, this one looks like as i said before the show it looks like a german expression is wolf clenching his butt hence the name the clencher um, so you know yeah yeah so i had to buy it <laughs> it makes sense <laughs> what are you drinking this week uh this week i unfortunately did not have time to go to the grocery store before i came home because uh, the shift change was late showing up so i have uh, defaulted to some um some red tail whiskey Mm. Uh, which I have been keeping on hand since the last time I had it on this show. Uh, still good. Still very smooth. Love Irish whiskey, so. Yeah, you can't go wrong. Pretty happy with that decision. Well, speaking of things that I didn't love, I <laughs> uh, <laughs> feel like we could, you know, talk about Tolstoy and what is to be done. Let's talk about what is to be done. Before we get into the, the book itself, uh, Matt, can you give us a little bit of background? Or at least let's talk about Tolstoy around this period in his life. Yeah, I can do my best to contextualize it a little bit. There's not that much to be said about it, I think, background-wise. It was published in 1886, so this is about a little over 20 years after Chernyshevsky's What is to be Done. So this really isn't a direct response to Chernyshevsky. It is more of just a general question that Tolstoy is posing and talking about for several hundred pages. But in his life, the 1880s, this is kind of a big boy spiritual crisis time for Tolstoy. And so he goes from... Writing something like War and Peace much earlier, which does things like celebrate family life and values like that, uh, a relatively conservative work compared to some of his others. Um, and then this is, again, many years later. This is three years before he writes the Kreutzer Sonata, which is 1889, which is where Tolstoy really kind of kind of flips. And he goes into this just weird phase in the rest of his life where he just writes like his version of Christian teachings for his last like 20 ish years. You can start to see the shift in some of his as you're getting towards his 80s crisis, like Anna Karenina, which was published in uh, 78, though he worked on it for like a million years. You can start to see if you're reading backwards some of the call them kernels of what will eventually become some of the spiritual uh, writings or yeah i mean i guess they're spiritual writings they're just kind of you know a little strange 
the very Tolstoyan, if you will. Um, so this is not one of his more popular works at all. People, I mean, it's completely subsumed by the Kreutzer Sonata. That's the one that for this time period, that's like the biggest changing point for him. But for a series on what is to be done, we had to read, of course, the what is to be done. And it, it tackles some of the same things in just a lot more pages, I think. <sighs> yeah. <laughs> you can clearly see the attitude we're going into this book with. I actually, I enjoyed a lot of it, but... Now, I share Matt's um, exasperation with the last fourth of the book. Okay, I think what, my, what I have to clarify is that when I went into this book, Cameron was telling me about it before it, and I don't, I don't think either of us had read it, so we didn't really know what we were getting into exactly. And he's like, oh, it's like half story and then half essay. But in reality, it's like one-sixth story, not a good story, and then like five-sixth. <laughs> essay would be generous, I think. Yeah. <laughs> Long rant, maybe tirade, perhaps. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I I do have kind of a lot of thoughts on it as, as a whole. I actually, I I did enjoy reading most of it, but th there were parts where I was like, okay, this is this is a lot of words to say what you're trying to say here, buddy. Yeah, yeah. Well, <clears throat> before we get into talking about the many many ideas put forth in this book, let's kind of summarize the book itself. There's really not a lot of point in giving like a play-by-play -play of this book because there's not much plot to speak of. As we already said, most of it is pretty much just him theorizing about various aspects of modern society, um, as well as his theorizations on where evil comes from. But it does get kicked off with a sort of emotional or spiritual awakening for him with regards to the problem of poverty in, in towns and cities. And that begins when he comes to Moscow and begins to learn about poverty in Moscow, since it has such a different character than what he's used to out in the country, uh, in that there are beggars everywhere, and also that begging in Moscow in this time is illegal. So he's quite shocked that constables are rounding up people for the mere act of asking for money, which he thinks is ridiculous. And that compels him to begin to kind of spend time among the working poor of Moscow and get to know them. And he has this kind of crisis of how could we let this happen to our fellow man? And he devises this plan to uh, distribute charity among the many people, because when he tries to give up money, he finds that he can't keep enough on his person. He feels very ashamed of that fact. So he writes an article to be published and he starts a campaign to get people involved and to distribute money. And it all basically comes to nothing. No one who promises him money ends up giving it to him. And even while he's talking to them, he feels that they're only agreeing with him out of politeness. And it would be as if it would be impolite for them to say, no, we don't want to help you help the poor and the, the needy. He really like that was a really funny conversation that he published because I could see that happening. You know, I've been in those conversations before, you know, <laughs> on which side? <laughs> Uh, you know, honestly, both. <laughs> That's fair. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I've been on that side when I I was at a show. I was I was playing for a friend of mine, and, and I saw this guy, and I knew him from Twitter. Uh, and I was like, oh my god, the, dude, this is crazy, but are you XYZ? And he's like, oh yeah, it's so cool. And he's like this dude from this really small, defunct communist podcast. Who I was, I didn't, I never listened to it. I wasn't even really that aware of who he was. I just knew him on the edges of my... Uh, of my like weird politics Twitter where I just had the, like this massive mm -hmm. array of all the strangest politics people. And I didn't even know this dude lived in my space. And he, he asked you for money. <laughs> no, he was, he was like, he, he was like, what do you do? But in a way that's like, he was like, I thought I was deeply involved in activism too. And I was like, nothing. <laughs> <laughs> I have a radio show where I interview people of clubs in the Davis Ooh. community. And he was like, Oh, I see. Mm -hmm. Um, <laughs> 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 um, <laughs> Yikes. But <clears throat> yeah, so tries to do a bunch. No one comes to help him with the exception of a couple of students who are working as census takers who end up giving him the funds, the payment they got for working as census takers, um, and which is another part of his plan. He wants to go into the um, he goes into a particular area which is known for having many tenements full of poorer people. And he wants to do censuses of these areas. And once they find out how many people are there, he plans to take the money which has been promised to him and distribute it to them. And uh, many census takers are hired for this, or at least a handful of students, really. Uh, and they're the only ones in the end who end up giving him any money. However, he does accompany the census takers during their tasks, and he ends up 
learning a fair amount about the variety of people who live in these areas and has some spiritual awakenings, really. Um, part of it is he realizes, even halfway through his plan, that this is really not a tenable idea. It's not going to work out, but he's already started it, so he's got to finish it, which, relatable. Um, mm, in a way. <laughs> so I only feel like that half the time, but I think in reality for me, most times I just quit. <laughs> yeah, that's fair. Well, I mean, once you've like published an article about it and are that's fair, that's yeah, fair. talking to people, it's kind of hard to get away from. Yeah, I get that. Really, the important thing to know about this is when he walks away and he's got he's had literally no money. He's he got maybe thirty two kopecks in the end just from gifts from people he knew or from the students to distribute among people in a tavern. He kind of has a crisis and he realizes that there's so many things wrong here. And it, the number one thing which is wrong is that I myself am kind of the cause of this problem. And, and I think the really only important thing to note is that he, he says. Really, my idle wealth can only come from the poverty of others. If there were not people in need who needed money in order to, to live, to buy food, I could not hire porters. If I didn't own land on which people worked, I wouldn't get any funds. I don't do anything. I just own land and I get money from that. My wealth is the reason why poorer people exist. And I am not merely a moneyed person in a society which does not have wealth, or in a society which there are many poor, but in fact... The very existence of wealthy people is why there are poor people. And then that kind of leads to the rest of the book. But that's really the important crisis he comes to here, although he has a great many in the process of this. Yeah, so he does about, you know, like I said, about a sixth of a page of narration, which is honestly some of his worst writing, I would say. Hmm. Um, I don't I don't know if he picked up on this in He's like almost self-aware in this where he like when he gets to the town and he's like, yes, you are all ready to be saved by my deep, thick Tolstoyan pockets. <laughs> and and then, you know, he comes to the realization that money probably isn't going to solve the deep rooted problems of society for some of these people. But there is just like, I don't know, <laughs> this like weird saviory overtone yeah. that he takes and then he still kind of takes even after his realizations in the town. Right. Part of his later crisis is to undo what he says earlier and that he's ki yeah. kind of trying to say, I can't be a savior like that because I am part of the problem. But he kind of maintains that tone because he's Tolstoy. Of course he does. Yeah, he's just a really interesting character throughout his life. Uh, whether he's ever able to successfully do what he wants to do, quite debatable. Yeah. I do have to say, a long time ago, I read the book Perestroika by Gorbachev. And the whole time I was reading it, I couldn't wrap my head around the fact that this, that this was written by the premier of the late Soviet Union because it really read like <laughs> a Wall Street Journal op-ed. Mm -hmm. And when I was reading this, I was like, am I reading like some early pre-Marxist socialist literature? Because it really has that vibe. Mm -hmm. And I'm, I'm kind of shocked that you can see definitely where Tolstoy differs from the socialists in Russia of his time. But it's it's more radical than I thought Tolstoy, even, and even knowing his kind of the radical offshoots which came from his thought um more than i was expecting yeah it was actually it was a little surprising for me i think i think just like compositionally it is much different than any of his novels or short stories where he's really creating characters and in this one he he does something which does it never results in good literature which is you come in with a predetermined mindset about what you want and he's, he's just placing that right down on top of you know it's it's autobiographical so it's not really prose i guess in the same way that like anna karenina is right uh but you know i, I would say overall uh, not his best yeah N not his best words on the page <laughs> i think he's got a couple of phrases here and there which are pretty like they kind of hit mm -hmm. but mm -hmm. they're, they're kind of few and far between i kind of like his early story i think overall it's kind of like i looked at it somewhat skeptically because when i was a million years ago when i was in college I did a lot of sociological stuff, and that was primarily, I was interested in uh, studying prisons in America, uh, a horrifying topic if you ever look into it. But tangentially, I had to deal with the problem of poverty, because of course, the problem of po poverty and the problem of policing in America are things that cannot be separated. Uh, and this exact like archetype of, of the kind of savior complex who approaches the problems of poverty mm. were someone or people that I read about like dozens and dozens of times. So even looking at that, I was kind of skeptical, but... You know, he, he kind of walked away with that with some good some good zingers. And even I think there was one really actually darkly funny moment when he's looking for money to fund his project. 
he comes across a high society ball and it's supposed to be for the benefit of the poor and they go to make <laughs> they go to make things for them and he walks in and he observes that there are all these people in fine dress white gloves a five course meal it's in a ballroom they have incredibly ostentatious ornamentation everywhere and he looks at what they're making and he's like what they're making is not even worth a, a tenth or maybe even a twentieth of the money that went into just putting this event on. If they had literally not done this and just given that money away, it would have done more good. Which leads into him, his later argumentation that a lot of what of of wealth at that level goes into is hiding yourself away from the realities of the lack of wealth and kind of an assuaging mm -hmm. an assuaging of your own guilt. So there are some moments like that which I think are incisive and funny. Um, but that's kind of a uh, a bit of a, a diamond in the rough mm -hmm. yeah it it is i i think i guess we can move on to like the his core yes. thesis if yeah. you will because he does say he does answer the question what is to be done directly twice so he's not not trying to hide it anywhere no he's really not and it's italicized it's right in your face about what is to be done so what is to be done matt well there's a lot of things to be done and we can kind of work up to it i think the first thing that he talks about is general wealth inequality between cities and country life in Russia at this time, which is actually still fairly applicable to today. Maybe not city country. Now we have more like core periphery models in economics that would be kind of comparable in, in which he says, basically, the only way that rich people in the cities can continue to be rich is because they take all the stuff that everybody, all the peasants in the country make. And so in order for them to do nothing, like you said earlier, there's a, a hundred or a thousand people that are required to work harder than they would have to do to support themselves so that they can support other people. And that is enforced through all sorts of mechanisms, through taxation, through loyalty to the state, through religion in some ways. And he really kind of builds on that idea that people who do nothing, uh, a prerequisite for them is people who do more than they need to. And that's an interesting thing to me because that basic line of argumentation is something that I'm really familiar with as a basically Marxist line of argumentation. But Tolstoy himself is not a Marxist. But he's arguing something along very similar lines, just not using the, the terminology I'm used to. And he has kind of a, a slightly different but really important difference in the conclusions that he comes to, which I think is interesting. Yeah, I mean, he's really working with religion on his basis which actually is i mean that's part of the reason why you you recognize it is just because just all of our thought so much is you know based in the same couple german philosophers who are in turn based in this the same kind of judeo-christian worldview that <laughs> i guess not everyone knows but that we all partake in knowingly or unknowingly and so he has this line um, from the Gospel of Luke where he says, he that has two coats, let him impart to him that has none. And he that has meat, let him do likewise. And that's kind of the, it's kind of the, the thesis, I guess, is that if you were to live by the gospel, like all of these so-called Christians in Russia at the time <laughs> purport to be doing, uh, then this wealth disparity should not exist. Literally, that... That phrase, he writes, well, what is to be done? Let John the Baptist answer that question. And then that that is, in short, if you stop listening right here, just read just read that line from the Bible and then listen to the song Once in, Your, Once in a Lifetime by the Talking Heads, and you've basically got the gist of this book. <laughs> yeah, I mean, Tolstoy in general throughout his life was really influenced particularly by the Sermon on the Mount and the ethical teachings of Christianity. He doesn't really believe in, I mean, he, I think, believes in spirituality broadly, but he's not like, he's not really into the mysticism of the church. He's really just into the, what are the core ethics that Jesus teaches? That's what I'm going to take. And that's what I'm going to apply to society. And that's kind of more or less what he does. You notice there's like really no mysticism at all. He just kind of cherry picks those couple lines. Keep in mind that he rewrites the entire story of the gospel into the gospel in brief, basically removing all fantastical elements into making it a, more of a pure morality tale, which he's not even the first major person in history to do that. I believe Thomas Jefferson did the same, or at least took a copy of the Bible and then just with a little knife took out all the, the parts with miracles in them. So 
He's in a mm -hmm. he's in H I won't say good tradition because I don't want to associate anything good with Thomas Jefferson, but a tradition. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, I do want to go back to the point you made earlier about the the divide between the countryside and the city, because I, I do think that's actually something that's really interesting. And of course, it's not as applicable today, but in terms of an analysis of the time, really interesting thing to point out, because when he's meeting many of the poor in Moscow, he sees many people who are not from Moscow, and they're from faraway places. And he kind of asks them, well, why are you coming here? And they're saying, well, we need to make money. I need to pay rent. I need to buy things. And He's kind of blown away by this because he, he kind of sits there and thinks, what is Moscow? What do any town anywhere produce? They are taking all the goods of the countryside. He says, quote, the village is the source of all wealth, and it only uh, there that real wealth is to be found. Grain and timber and horses and everything. Uh, horses, of course, are the most important because that, that's where you produce the all-important kumis. Um, <laughs> but, you know, like everything of import comes from the, the countryside, which if you listen to our episode on how much land does a man need, you'll already be familiar with the fact that Tolstoy is really into the idea of a peasant commune and, and really kind of everyone should get out of the city and get into places where you don't own any property and instead it is owned by the collective, et cetera, et cetera, to avoid the nastiness that, that people can do to each other. And he kind of says that wealth is hard to have in the country because in the countryside, people don't have a lot of things. They don't have easy access to solutions. There's a lot of poverty out there, and it's uncomfortable to have wealth out in the countryside. Um, and he writes, what seems frightening and awkward to him, the moneyed person in the country, here, the city, seems to him quite proper. The rich assemble in town, and there, under the protection of the authorities, calmly demand all that has been brought thither from the country. Again, pointing out that all their wealth, again, in this point in time, you can only be so many things. You can only be a person of idle wealth from so many professions. And that's really like a banker in the civil service, a scientist, an artist, a landowner, a money lender, et cetera, et cetera. Um, by far, in a way, I'd say the majority of these are, are money lenders, <laughs> except for maybe some, you know, like tax collectors who can buy rights to taxes, which is a, an entirely different thing, which we can't even touch upon here, but. Like a wild period in history. Yeah. And yeah. <laughs> so Tolstoy is kind of pointing out that uh, people don't come to the city because they want to come to the city, although he does kind of address that. There's some parts of this book which are about individual moral failings and how the city has all these things that the country said will never provide. But really, what he's trying to say is that people come to the city because they need money, because you can't earn all that money out in the countryside, and sometimes there is even no money to be earned. So people come here, and then there's not as much opportunity because they're being relentlessly exploited. And why do they need money? Because they need to pay taxes, if nothing else. They can't just live a subsistence lifestyle because the government, and this time taxes weren't really based on, like, I can't speak to other countries, but in the American context, you pay taxes on what you own, um, your your income, depending on what state you're in, what you, like, property you own, et cetera, et cetera. There was like a kind of a flat tax. And so people, even if you... It was not a progressive income tax. Oh, no. no. Yeah. So even if you earn no money, you still owed money to the state. So you were kind of forced to, to find rubles in some sort of way. And he points out that really, where do all these rubles go? People are earning money. And where is it ending up? It's ending up in the hands of the idle rich. It's ending up in the money in the hands of the landowners, of the tax right holders. It's holding up, it's ending up in the hands of the bankers, people who live very idle lifestyles. And our lifestyles could not be sustained without the workers. If there were no workers, we wouldn't exist. We couldn't maintain our lifestyles. We would be the workers in that case. Yeah, I like the ones where he, <laughs> where he destroys economics, but the the um, it's kind of in his division of labor rant, which I, I honestly struggle a little bit to follow. Like I kind of I got the gist of it, which is right. we need to, that it's okay for labor to be divided. It just needs to be redivided in a more, I guess, like equitable way, right. in a way in which people are actually doing work. Um, but he, yeah. he really comes for people that have educations, which is like, you know, I, it's okay, but it's a little bold of him to be like the... <laughs> the person saying this when he like okay i like it's hard to contextualize now like how much wealth tolstoy actually had like he had so much like enough that he could gamble away his ancestral home and still be fine to do nothing for the rest of his life like an insane amount of wealth and so he spent a lot of it just locked away studying kind of 
at being able to be productive in this literary sense because his wife did so much for him. So this is kind of a quick aside to say these are interesting points, but Tolstoy also guilty. I know, I guess he realizes it, but he really is guilty of more than he lets on, I think. Yeah, he he kind of like gives enough guilt that you feel his remorse. Uh, He kind of brings it up when he talks about one day when he was with a laborer and they see a beggar on the streets and he ends up giving the beggar 20 kopecks and the laborer he's with ends up giving the guy three kopecks. And as they're walking away, Tolstoy kind of thinks about it. And although his gift as a whole on the absolute level is a lot more to the beggar, he realizes this guy is with his whole life is 600 kopecks. And three kopecks is not a huge amount of that, but that's like almost a day's wages for him. That's a lot of money. And he's just given away 20 kopecks of literally well over 100,000 rubles. Way more than that. And he thinks like the amount of wealth I just gave away is so infinitesimally small compared to this man who literally just gave away a full day's wages. And he has a family just like me. He's got he's got a wife. He's got kids. So do I. And I gave infinitely less than this guy did proportionally, which leads you into some of his guilt. Although to your point, I think that is not necessarily designed, but something he intended as like a mea culpa, but not a obviously not a full mea culpa because he was way more into he was way more integrated into this very system that I think even he's willing to let on, even as he's condemning it. Mm-hmm. Okay, so the academia line. It's not as spicy as I recall it being, but he, he's talking about the, <laughs> the division of labor, and he says when a man from his infancy up to his 30th year lives on the shoulders of other men promising to do when he finishes his study, something very useful, which nobody has ever asked him for, and the rest of his life in the same way, promising only to do presently something which nobody asked him to do, this would not be a true division of labor. (laughs) (laughs) And I just think about, um, you know, I do think humanities are important, of course. Um, But, you know, no one's asking me to study, I suppose. (laughs) So in, in the same way, I'm kind of doing this but hey no one's asking us for this podcast and yet here we are and yet here we are well i guess in my mind i'm i mean i'm taking the money from a university which is really only making money off of like endowment interest i think Mm. so like that's that's fine it doesn't really count he didn't think about that did he yeah but your point in talking about the division of labor he's really up on a lot of the features which are just so to him arbitrary and really just to serve really just serve to reinforce the difference between poor and rich. Yeah, he goes in on some of that stuff. Oh, yeah. He goes in on education because, of course, if you education is not cheap, especially in this time, he goes in on on the idea of cleanliness, uh, which you might Mm -hmm. think is like, on your face is ridiculous, but keep in mind that, you know, these guys are like having a person do their laundry like every single day. So, you know, today he's putting out like, you know, we need to have someone who has his shirt washed every day. They need to have fresh gloves every day. Otherwise, it's not really proper. And if you're a working person, you obviously, I mean, first of all, affording white silk gloves and like a proper tail suit is already hard enough. But keeping it washed every single day as your employer demands of you, that takes us that 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 would take up your whole time. That's that's why you have a specialized class that could do this, because they are the only ones who have the time that can, can do that by virtue of being paid enough. And, and he writes uh, I'm, I became convinced that between us, the rich and the poor, there stands a wall of cleanliness and education that we have erected and raised uh, by our wealth. And to be able to aid the poor, we have first of all to destroy the wall. I reached the same conclusion to which the course of my reflections on town poverty had brought me, that the cause of that poverty is our very wealth. So, you know, getting back to the same problem of, of the existence of his own class, he is the problem he comes to the conclusion to. Do you mind if we talk about money for a little bit? Because he really goes in on yeah. the concept of money. Yeah, it was very it was very interesting. And the role of money and how it just perpetuates the problem. Yeah. He does actually like a very interesting analysis that I was not expecting him to do. Whether it's actually correct or not, I'm probably not educated in that area enough to say, but he goes through his own version of like colonial history and the issue of of money and it's it's quite interesting. It was an interesting way to think about it, for sure. Yeah, I think... So Tolstoy goes through a basic history of money. And I'm obviously not an expert in the history of money. Uh, but from my basic education, I think it's a little bit simplistic, but it basically serves the argumentation. Uh, his generalization of, of societies which don't use money as we would recognize it, again, a little bit simplistic, but not exactly wrong. I do think it is really interesting that he makes the point that 
he essentially connects, he doesn't use the phrase wage slavery, but he essentially implies that all, uh, all, all labor in the modern era is a form of wage slavery. And mm-hmm. he points that out by saying, <clears throat> of course, in, in this period of time, in the majority of the world, slavery is technically illegal, emphasis on technically. Um, <laughs> and he says, you know, in, in past eras, slavery was such a direct thing. It was by the threat of violence or by ownership and, and, you know, court systems. And slavery was an obvious thing. However, today it's less obvious because we think of it as natural that people who have to work for their for money, this thing, or they'll starve to death because it's kind of connected with something that's true that even in past eras, even outside of a place where you had slavery, if you didn't work on your farm or your trade where you could trade for food or something, you would starve to death. However, this is a very insidious idea in relation to how money actually works. And he, he starts on a broad level of an analysis of the imperialist imperialist takeover of the islands of Fiji. And basically, in brief, what he, he points to is you have the islands of Fiji, which are their own independent thing. And then at some point, there is a bit of violence with some citizens of the U.S. And the U.S. demands $45,000 in restitution from the Fijian government. The problem there being that at this point in time, the people of Fiji did not have money as the rest of the world would recognize it, which is not to say that they did not have things that they used in equivalent places to trade or to, you know, barter or whatever, but just that they didn't participate in the economic system that the European system used. And of course, they couldn't really pay that. So then the United States brought in gunboats and raised the fee to $90,000 now and began uh, taking the best land in, in Fiji. And at this point, the go- the the leadership of the islands went to an outside agency and was like, can you help us figure out, like, how do we how do we pay fines? How do we get money for this, et cetera, et cetera? And the company helped them with the caveat that they ended up basically taking all the best land in Fiji as payment for that. And so now they have what would become plantations. And the government of Fiji still owes money to now to this company. And they're like, where do I get money from? So the they go to like their friends who are versed in the system. And they say, oh, well, levy a tax. One, you know, dollar for every man, a certain amount of cents for every woman. And now the entire population of Fiji, who again, who did not participate in a monetary system equivalent to, um, as, as the Europeans would recognize it, now have to start earning money as the Europeans would recognize it. So now they have to go get labor. And of course, only the Europeans are offering your Euro- European uh, or Western compensation. So it's the plantations. And now these people who have not worked in this sort of system are being relentlessly taken advantage of on plantations for very low wages so they can pay pay rent or pay taxes to the government who are not making any money and are still deep in debt until they go make a deal with the English. Basically, it's just a cycle where once the, the tool of money becomes a cudgel against people, where what, what Tolstoy says is that it, there's this idea that there is no control over money. But the reality is that, of course, someone controls the flow of money. In, in the Russian context, yeah, of course, if in one area, if the lords want a certain good, that good's going to cost more. If the lords don't want a certain good, it's going to cost less. If they ask, if they pay their peasants more for a certain crop, it's that more of that crop is going to exist, it's going to be cheaper. It's not an unconscious market-based decision. It's based on the decisions of many, many people. And we can't really say that that's, you know, just how things work. That is the choices of individuals which create the value of money, making it, to a certain extent, arbitrary. And when it's arbitrary, that means it can be manipulated, such as in the case of Fiji. And by that method, money becomes not just a neutral method of goods and services, but rather a cudgel. And he relates that to exactly uh, like the people of his own country, that um, people need to pay taxes. They need to pay a flat rate. So they need to go somewhere where they can earn money. So they go to cities and that's where they get relentlessly taken advantage of. And that's where you start having generational poverty happening because, you know, it's not like poverty is an inherent thing that's always existed here. Uh, Some forms of poverty have always existed. But in this particular context, no, this isn't Moscow is an artificial town. It had to be created, had to be introduced. So in that way, he attacks the system of money as as basically not a neutral thing, as economists would like to claim. Not just not neutral, but as a as a, actually a violent force. People saying that, or economists, I guess at the time, saying that money has nothing to do with violence. Yeah. He, he has this quote that I thought was funny. Uh, he says, well, it's not really funny, but it was funny when I was reading it. Uh, he says, the... Enslaving of the majority of the people depends upon taxes collected by the government from its own land slaves. Taxes collected by the troops, by the very same troops, which are maintained by the means of these taxes. 
So he he actually he kind of does this thing that he also rails against where he rails against Hegel at a lot of points for proposing like a systematic philosophical theory of life. But then I I can't help but feel like he's also proposing in some ways a systematic theory as well. He's like, I mean, yeah, maybe it's based more on individual need and equity and things like that and not rationality. But I don't know. <laughs> yeah, he kind of does. He's really, really close to extant systematic critiques of a society, which basically mm -hmm. had the same conclusions, but he's just like slightly off. Yeah, like he does. He surprisingly does connect a lot of areas that I didn't think I didn't think he was going to do a critique of global colonialism. I didn't think that was where Tolstoy was about to go with it. But yeah, no, he does. And he, he connects it with money and he connects it with the institutions of the state and the historical development of the state. And just honestly fascinating because no class I've ever taken has talked about this book just because like, you know, it's a little weird. It's a little <laughs> out there. Yeah. But it's actually okay. So that's the thing is it's not actually as out there as I thought. Right. You could like, I don't know, if you took certain passages of this book, if you took that section in Fiji and you just gave me that, I'd be like, oh, that's funny. I haven't read Chomsky in a while. Um, <laughs> <laughs> this language is a little archaic, but uh, yeah, it makes sense. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. You can also really see how he becomes the inspiration for um, specifically Christian anarchism. Uh, and then he, mm -hmm. he really rails against the state. Um, and this is, this is a line I actually like a lot. <clears throat> this superstition is quite... Uh, quite similar to the religious superstition. It consists in the assertion that besides man's duty to man, there exists yet more important obligations to an imaginary being. For theology, this imaginary being is God. But for political science, it is the state. Um, and then he goes on to rail relentlessly against political silence, science, which uh, despite my degree basically being in that, I'm all here for. Um, <laughs> he's, not, he's not wrong. I mean, I think it's actually, it was really fascinating that the assertions he put forward here in that his, his tie between the religious uh, superstition and kind of the belief in the state is not actually that different from, there's this book called Imagined Communities by uh, Benedict Anderson. And it's basically a study of nationalism. Today, it's really outdated. If you want to understand nationalism, I would really only read that as a jumping off point to more modern and perhaps more correct by virtue of following, you know, improving his work authors. Uh, that being said, one of the major arguments that Anderson puts forth for the development of modern nationalism is that historically, reason societies, the mythos of societies is something that allows you to justify your own suffering. In that, in, in this case, why are you suffering in both in Tolstoy Anderson's argument? Well, it's you're suffering for God, for, you know, something, et cetera, X, Y, Z thing. And the, and the problem of post-enlightenment uh, philosophies in Anderson's line of argumentation is that it didn't have a metaphysical component. Liberalism and Marxism especially, uh, while they did argue for, you know, reasons for a state to exist and here's how the world works and here are the mechanisms, it didn't provide like a real, like, it didn't provide a real justification for why suffering happens. There's no reason in inherent to liberalism or Marxism why you fell off your bike and now you've got a massive injury or, you know, you're, you're paralyzed for life. Whereas in, I don't know, in religion, there's usually a reason for that, or at least a justification for it. And he, Anderson then ties that to, well, nationalism it kind of does the same thing as religion, that why do you go off and fight to war? In olden times, you might have said it's for God. Now you say it's for, for God and country, depending on where you are, maybe just country, which Tolstoy even uh, even addresses at some point, that we, we, we use this idea of fictional enemies abroad in order to fight and and dredge up nationalism among, among our peoples for this idea of the state, which he kind of attacks as illegitimate. They're not exactly one-to-one, -one, but I thought it was really fascinating that Tolstoy kind of wrote like the bare-bones version of uh, a really uh, foundational piece of um, sociological thinking over 100 years later. Yeah, to Tolstoy, he, he really do be like that. <laughs> he was attacked pretty relentlessly at the end of Anna Karenina when Vronsky goes off to fight in the Serbian? War? Yeah, let's say the Serbian <laughs> War. Um, you know, for this idea of pan Slavism and Tolstoy's kind of poking fun at it, saying, you know, why do we need to go fight for other people? What we need to focus on is right here in front of us. And well, that's a pretty contentious point of debate at that time and also today. Right. But I feel like we should talk about what is to be done 
because I have his three points here. Can I? Can we talk about? Can we dump on Malthus real quickly before you get to that? Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. 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 Mm. I also so there's a lot in this book that we're not going to get to, and I'd actually kind of encourage you to read this for yourself. It will probably only take you a couple hours at most. It's actually really interesting. You can find a copy of it for free online just by Googling what is to be done, uh, Tolstoy. And part of the reason I'm encouraging you to do that is because he dunks relentlessly on Thomas Malthus. And <laughs> frankly, we don't do that enough as a society. Mm -hmm. um, he, If you're not familiar with Thomas Malthus, he was basically a political economist. And one of the only things which have trickled down to, I would say, mainstream consciousness is his idea of predator prey populations and how that basically how that basically evens out and, and how like there's an inverse relationship between predators and prey, which was applied, uh, unfortunately, to human populations and predators basically were substituted for rich elite classes and prey were substituted for poorer classes, which was used to justify all sorts of horrible things by the British Empire, not least of all um, when the, you might be familiar with the Irish potato famine, which everyone knew about at the time, and actually, fun fact, there was actually enough food in Ireland to feed everyone, it was just owned by British owners who were exporting that food, which were not potatoes, back to Britain. Um, there were debates in Parliament at this time as to whether or not relief should be given to these people, and they used this line of logic, Malthus's reasoning, to say, well, well, if we gave them aid and stopped them from starving to death now, they would just want a handout later. Uh, and then they let uh, basically a fourth of the population of Ireland die because of that logic. Whoops. Yeah, whoops. Um, also did that a <laughs> bunch of times in India. Fun facts. Um, so uh, Tolstoy is Britain. just harps on on Malthus for creating a pseudo law of a population which has become axiomatic and conclusions from other people are drawn from this as if it's inherently true which it's not especially not in the way that it's applied because in this era you had this a kind of convergence between the study of natural life and the study of human life and that really hit its apotheosis with Darwin's theories and and Darwin of course puts forth the theory of evolution becomes really big and then there's this dude who we should all hate uh, Herbert Spencer, who kind of combines Darwin's theories with his own ideas about society and who unfortunately I think would later go on to influence Darwin's works as well, and creates this notion which we today know as social Darwinism, in that the fittest survive and the weakest die. Uh, and there's this, this idea of society as an organism becomes really popular because people love to, to think of human humanity in like natural basically take on the naturalistic fallacy. Tolstoy goes off for so many chapters about this idea of human society as an organism because, the, well, first of all, <laughs> there's no good reason to think of human society as that. It's not that useful. But secondarily, if you think of human society as an organism, then that inherently justifies what exists today. And a huge feature of this book, and especially when he rails on academics and scientists, and when he says scientists, he means economists and political scientists, is that they have taken what is today, what is in the context they exist in, they have turned those into axiomatic laws into what should be. And then they take those laws and apply those into other places in the world, such as, for example, Fiji. They've taken the laws of what they know they see, and they assume, well, this is how things must be. But they see places where that's not the case. They're like, well, I guess we have to go kill some people until suddenly the truth is the truth again. Uh, and... He, he really just goes off on this idea of society as an organism and he, this this notion that, well, if, if society is an organism, then naturally there must be these these things, poverty, crime, uh, people starving to death in the streets while other people, you know, eat five course meals not two blocks away. That must be a feature of society. That's not something we can ever undo. And that becomes this, this fatal line of thinking, which means we'll never solve this problem, which becomes the line of thinking, which then never solves that problem. Um, and he, he writes that, you know, at least this line of thinking that, you know, <laughs> you look at the poor the poor and say, well, why have they been so stupid to be born when they know they will have nothing to eat? And so the rich and powerful classes are not to blame for anything and may quietly continue to live as before. And he goes on to attack Darwin uh, directly, which I think is kind of incorrect. I think he's more so talking about Herbert Spencer's social Darwinism, although he does later address Herbert Spencer specifically. So maybe he read more Darwin than I did. I don't know. But yeah, it really goes off on a lot of the scientists of his era, rightfully so. Um, and the fact that the fact that I, when I was in high school in the year of our Lord 2015, was taught Thomas Malthus's theory of populations as if it was a real, actual feature of economics is just a complete travesty of education. Um, and I didn't realize until years later when I was re reading the book um, American Capitalism by Kenneth Galbraith, who was an economist in the well, over a long period of time, but he wrote this book in the late 1940s, lamenting basically that theoretical models that 
were used to describe an ideal society, which he was in support of, were taught in high schools as actual, like, this is actually how the market works instead of, well, I would love, you know, at his level, like, I would love that this were the case and we think we should work towards that. And I was reading that and I was like, oh my God, this is what I learned today in economics. Yep, 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 yep. Uh, well, today, you know, in high school. So <laughs> that's, I think that's the problem of teaching economics in high school is then I get comments on Facebook. Uh, I see comments on Facebook about people go, well, it's actually just simple economics if you think about it. And I got to shake my head, take a deep breath and walk away. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, I don't know. You see someone be like, oh, it's actually, this is a really simple feature of political science. And you kind of just step in and be like, uh, it's a simple feature of political science because we have to teach it to idiots who don't know anything about political science. Mm -hmm. When you get three or four years in, you've got to really unlearn a lot of the basic stuff about political science because it's actually a lot more complex than that. Uh, unfortunately, yep. none of those answers are satisfying whatsoever. So we don't start with that because they're hard and not and not all that useful without a lot of context. But yep, 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 yep. But uh, I don't want to learn those because I can't post those as like. Uh, good comebacks on Facebook. Right. So yeah. I'll, I'll stick with the I'll stick with the easy stuff. Yeah. That works with you. Unfortunately, taking yeah. down um, democratic peace theory is not something anyone wants or needs on Facebook. Well, they might need it, but no one wants that on Facebook on whatever <laughs> side. But if you do want to ever hear my opinions on democratic peace theory, just message me. I'll talk about mm -hmm. it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, can we get to yes? What we what needs to be done? I'm dying to hear what needs to be done. Oh, I'm dying to talk about what needs to be done because I got them written down here. <laughs> First, to avoid deceiving myself. However far I have gone astray from that road of life, which my reason shows to me, I must not be afraid of the truth. So basically saying, you got to realize what's going on around you. You got to be open to hearing <laughs> what you've done wrong. Secondly, to renounce my own righteousness, my own advantages, peculiarities, distinguishing me from others, and to confess the guilt of such... Give away your property, live like the peasants, get rid of the barrier that exists between you. That's the only way that you'll ever be able to be seen by them on their own level. Thirdly, to fulfill that eternal, unquestionable law of man by laboring with all my being to struggle with nature, to sustain my own life and the lives of others. So not just being somebody who spends all day playing cards, gambling, drinking, shooting, whatever, actually laboring in a way that Tolstoy deems as natural, tending the fields, agricultural work. He really loves agricultural work conceptually. He loves labor. Yeah. Tolstoy, he loves labor. He hates property. Yep. Yeah. He, at some point in the book, he even says that the, the worst drunkards in any tenement are better than him uh, because they at least, uh, in stealing for their drink, uh, steal Im immensely less than he does on a daily basis just by the property, just by taxing his own serfs. Um, mm -hmm. Which... <laughs> uh, yeah kind of goes into a lot of that really is for him and the what is to be done really is addressed to more elite moneyed classes because obviously um if you are not a pro property holder or otherwise very money you wouldn't really need to hear these things right but yeah he, he there's a, honestly a lot more that he addresses in here which is really interesting just from like a political science perspective which we just don't have the time to get to but i really recommend you read this i i mean of I also would recommend you read all all of the books we've read so far. They're kind of a drag. They're not that exciting. They don't have like the literary value of of what we've been reading beforehand and many, many redeeming features that other things have. But just as like a pure work of political science, I think these are interesting. Yeah, if you're into the political science stuff, like we clearly are, it'll be interesting. Uh, if you want to read Tolstoy, talk about people at uh, balls and dinners. Well, I wouldn't read this one, but... You know, well, he does talk about <laughs> balls and dinners. It's just in the context of in a him, way. him talking about balls and then talking about people who we knew who starved to death that night, not not many mm -hmm. blocks away, which is much less fun. Whoops. Yeah. Um, and then at the very end, in the very last chapter, he really goes hard into anti-feminism, which is really loud to left field and really, yeah, really just gave me a lot of whiplash. We're going to have to we're going to have to talk about that when we eventually go over the Kreutzer Sonata. It's too small of a piece of this work to go into depth right now, but like, you know, it's it's not great. It's not good. That's not good. Honestly, if you just stop mm -hmm. reading after maybe chapter 30, you're not going to miss a whole... Like, read... Stop reading after chapter 30, read chapter 39, you're not going to miss anything, really. Yeah, At that point, it's really just defining industry and questioning who this industry works to the benefit for, which could be interesting, but you could easily, very easily not read it without missing anything. And then you don't have to read chapter 40, which is also a benefit in and of itself. Yep, absolutely. Okay, well. Well. 
Yeah, I had a good time with it. Um, yeah. But what I really got to know, Cameron, is mm. on a scale from one to Yeltsin, how drunk are you from this episode? <sighs> okay, so after I didn't have time to get a second glass of whiskey because I was too impassioned by my, my mm-hmm. um, uh, rage against Thomas Malthus. Yes. Yep. Um, that I did not, I did not have time to refill. So I'm, I'm at a light, uh, I, I'm, I'm at like the light high society kind of drunk, you know, at the balls where mm-hmm. you're obviously drinking some fancy champagne, um, mm-hmm. but not ma- drinking so much that you're making a fool out of yourself and ruining your marriage prospects. Sure, sure. Right. How about you? I, I think I'm, uh, I'm similar because I also didn't have time to get any sort of refill. But then I realized that the beer I'm drinking is eight point seven percent. So it's probably for the best that I didn't. Yeah, yeah. So you know, I'm I'm good. Happy to be here. Happy to be here. That's fair. That's <laughs> fair. Um. So I mean, everyone probably already knows the answer to this question. But for the sake of keeping up our system and our our general method, what are we reading next week, Matt? Well, next week we are going to be reading Vladimir Lenin's "What Is to Be Done," the third and final work from our "What Is to Be Done." series talk about a communist party yeah i wrote that joke in the script so i'm gonna (laughs) i'm gonna say it (laughs) i hope you're all ready to learn about vladimir lenin's intense opinions about uh uh, crop production and why Mm -hmm. obscure political parties you've never heard of are wrong um (laughs) oh it's gonna be fun it's gonna be really fun i think that okay so it's not it's definitely not a work of literature it's a theoretical political work yeah but it is the culmination of everything that we've been reading about this week in last week and how it eventually will get applied to the Soviet Union. So it's super fascinating and it does in fact have a really big impact on the literature of the Soviet Union going forward. So it'll be fun, I promise. <laughs> <clears throat> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Indeed. Well, before we let you go, we want to extend a sincere thank you to all of our current patrons. We got Jeff, Janice, Anne, Emily, Madeline, Daniel, Darren, Gary, Daniel again, Jack, Alex, and Roland. Ah, so many, but I enjoy saying all the names every time. <laughs> the Daniels still have not sent us their private information, such as their SSNs or their addresses, so we still can't differentiate. Very you, strange. But, uh, we'll have yep. to we'll have to keep waiting on that one. Maybe we just need to check our DMs again. <laughs> Yeah. Well, podcasting isn't free and grad school doesn't pay very well. So if you're interested in joining with our current patrons to keep the show running, take a look at our Patreon at patreon.com slash tipsy Tolstoy. The music used in this episode was Soviet March by Toasted Tomatoes. You can find more of their stuff on toastedtomatoes.bandcamp.com and also on YouTube under the same username. If you're looking for other places to find us, you can also follow us on Instagram at Tipsy Tolstoy Podcast or join our email list on our website, tipsytolstoy.com. You'll hear from us again soon.